Well, good morning. Good morning. I stand, I rise, and I praise God from whom all blessings flow. Um, first of all, to the angel of this house. Can we stop right now and praise God for the angel and for the first lady um, of this house? Um, I'm certainly um, grateful to be able to share um, in ABC Day um, as well as with um, the Zoe Church. Um, I will make sure that I give the correct report um, when I get back to Nashville. You don't want to go to Racine, Wisconsin and not stop by the Zoe Church. <laughs> you, 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 you don't, you just don't want to go to Wisconsin and not stop by. Um, I feel definitely at home. Um, that I, I, I definitely um, feel at home. Y'all give me a second to get uh, my bearings um, in order. Um, I think um, I've been set up though. I think this has been a setup. <laughs> The weather, I've been gone from Cleveland for 16 years now, so I'm used to Nashville weather. So between the weather, the hour of sleep that I lost, and the bus uh, having a blowout on yesterday, something good had to come out of today. And I am convinced, I am convinced that um, this is the evidence um, of all that we've gone through this weekend. I'm getting the opportunity um, to share um, with you all on um, this morning. Um, I don't feel the greatest uh, with the weather change, um, but um, because I'm from Cleveland <laughs> and a Cleveland Browns fan, kind of, um, we make the adjustment. Um, so again, we thank God for the opportunity um, anytime to stand um, and to praise God through um, the word. It has been said, I heard it as a little boy, and they emphasized it when I arrived at the American Baptist College that the gospel hasn't been preached until you go to Calvary. And while I'm not here to give any type of homiletical to debate to that, what I will say that if it's good enough for the close, for the ending, for the climax, for the epilogue, then it's good enough for the beginning, the intro, or the prologue. So per adventure, you are here. There once was a man by the name of Jesus, who still is, who went around doing good. And in the midst of doing good, he got in some trouble. And they brought him up on trumped up charges, found him guilty, and as a result, over 2,000 years ago, y'all know where I'm going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They marched him up Gargotha's Hill. Yeah. They hung him high. Yeah. They stretched him wide. And he hung his head. And for all of us, he died. Yeah. They put him in a borrowed tomb. Yeah. And he got up on that third day morning wow. with all power in his hand, ascended back to heaven to sit next to God the Father on the right hand, and every time I blow it, every time we blow it, he leans over to God the Father and reminds him, don't forget about what I've already done. I've already paid that price. And there's greater news that saying Jesus the Christ is coming back for you and I, and that is the gospel according to Jesus the Christ. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, having said that, let's go ahead and get to work. Um, our attention today, our text comes today um, from the New Testament Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verse 26. The New Testament Gospel 
as recorded by Luke. Chapter 14, verse 26. We'll just deal with um, one verse and allow as much as that verse as time allows us on this morning. Signify that you said it by have it by saying amen. amen. And I'll be quoting um, a hybrid or different translations um, of Luke chapter 14, verse 26. And it says, if anyone comes unto me, and this is Jesus who is speaking, he must hate his mother, his father, his wife, or husband, children, brother, sister, and even one's own life, then they cannot be my disciple. Amen. Amen. You all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. This morning, I want to preach <clears throat> from the subject, the Jesus I thought I knew. The Jesus I thought I knew. Each of the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have their own unique way of writing about the life of Jesus. But I am persuaded that it is Dr. Luke, the physician, who usually gives us a little bit deeper of understanding of what some of the other gospel writers may have written as well, but because he's a physician, mm -hmm. he's been taught, he's been trained to look at things from the details. Right. One of the things that, or the details in which um, St. Luke, if you will, um, gives us from his perspective about the three-year earthly life, public life of Jesus the Christ, he gives us a sneak peek and how he dealt with other people. And Luke usually writes, anytime you find Jesus hanging around people, it was usually people who were marginalized, the outcasts, women, children, misfits, the least, the left out, the lost, and those that were not accepted by society. In his book, Moments with the Savior, the author by the name of Ken Jire uh, pens and he captures these moments or these encounter with Jesus and he puts them into one of four categories. And for the alliteration purposes, I will be using the letter I. He says, when Jesus comes into contact or has a moment, he said it either falls up under intense moment, intimate moment, instructional moment, or incredible moment. When um, there's some type of intimate moment, it seems to be some type of one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, whether it was one-on-one -on -one or he was talking to the crowd. Intimate. And then I also find that there were also times that it was intense. It was some type of heat or some type of fire up under the point of what Jesus was trying to get across. And then we find that there were times that there were instructional moments. And in these times, Jesus is giving some type of direction. And then there's the incredible moment where there's the wow factor, where there's no explanation for it. It's just Jesus doing what it is that Jesus does. Well, the unique thing that I love about scripture, that I love about God, that I love about Jesus is you can have a moment or an encounter with Jesus and it can fit in one, two, three, or all four of these categories. It can be intimate, 
and or it can be intense and on it can be instructional and or it can be incredible and that's just like the God we serve it can be intimate to me but it can be instructional on this side it can be incredible on this side and God has a way of putting that thing all together and that's what I believe happens in Luke chapter 14 verse 26 I believe all four of these categories are here. There's intense moment, an intimate moment, an instructional moment, and an incredible moment. Let me set the scene or give the backdrop as far as Luke chapter 14 is concerned. Although we're in Luke chapter 14, we need to go back to Luke around chapter 9. In chapter 9, Jesus is leaving Galilee. He is leaving his earthly ministry in the city of Galilee, and he's on his way to Jerusalem for the last time. This is uh, located in modern day Palestine, if you will. And at this particular point in time, they are up under um, the government um, or the rulership of the government of that day and at that time. And so Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, but because he's having moments with individuals who shouldn't have moments according to the Roman government. Jesus begins to gain momentum. Uh -huh. People begin to follow him. And there begin to be a crowd wherever it is that he goes. And that brings us up to Luke chapter 14 around verses 1. And when we arrive there on verse 1, Jesus is in a man's house who's a Pharisee. Uh -huh. It's Saturday, which is the Sabbath. It is the Lord's day and nothing happens on the Lord's day as of stuff pertaining to the Lord. So that will be our modern day Sunday. But Jesus being the, the, the intellect and the thinker that he is um, while they're in the house, they're having a meal. And he notices that there's a man who has some swelling on his body. And Jesus asked the question. He said, shall we not? heal this man although it's the sabbath and jesus already knew what they would be thinking and the pharisees said absolutely nothing because how can you do something that's for the lord on the lord's day but not supposed to do it because it's that day we gotta get beyond tradition and deal with people's lives and the value that we have on them. So whether it's a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday again, it's always a time for Jesus to do what it is that he does. And so Jesus heals the man and the people are astonished or whatever the case may be. And Jesus goes on and keep doing what he does. So he tells two stories. He tells a parable, if you will, because he knows what they were thinking. And the more Jesus talks, the more people begin to listen. And he says, oh, yeah, by the way, if you want to follow me, you got to hate. Father, mother, wife or husband, we just going to round up with spouse, them kids, your siblings, and even your own life if you want to be my disciple. Well, well, well I think what's important to know that at this particular point in time, there aren't 12 disciples. There are only four disciples. Peter his brother Andrew, uh -huh. James, and his brother John. Yeah. Now we're probably most familiar with Peter, James, and John because they are part of Jesus's inner circle. Uh -huh. You know, sometimes you can't take everybody with you, but sometimes you can take some of the people with you. 
So more times than not, when there were the 12 disciples, Peter, James, and John were the three that got a chance to be a part of the inner circle. But wait a minute, Peter had a brother by the name of Andrew, who's also a disciple at this particular point in time. And I dare not assume that everybody here knows who Andrew was or is. Do y'all remember when Jesus uh, took two fish and five loaves of bread and fed 5,000 people, not including uh, women and children? Well, you know, it was Philip. The disciple at that time that said, send them away because we don't have enough money and we don't have any food. But it was Andrew. Uh But it was Andrew. The one who wasn't a part of the inner circle, who found the little lad with the little lunch and told Jesus about the little lad with the little lunch. And Jesus was able to feed the 5,000 because of Andrew who found the little lad with the little lunch. Let me pause parenthetically and say, you may not be popular, but you just play your part and God will be faithful to you and have you do what you are called to do. Hello, Andrews. It may not be Peter. You may not be John, and you may not be James, but y'all can be Andrew. If I was sitting in my homiletics class with Dr. William V. Green, the first, he would tell us to look at the text through different lenses. One of the texts, or one of the lenses that he taught us to look at when we look, look at scripture and read scripture is the seal initiative. Okay. And what the seal initiative is, it's an initiative that has been adopted by the American Baptist College that we attempt to live off of. And the seal stands for the S. It's for the social justice. E is for equity. The A is advocacy. And the L is for leadership. And so they've taught us, when we look at scripture, glean through one of those four and see if it's in there or if it's not in there. So what I want to lean in on this morning, I want to lean in on the L for the leadership part of it. Because let's look, come, come a little bit closer. We're talking about Jesus, the Christ, son of the living God. Didn't the praise good team just get done talking about something about love and love and this and love and this and that. But then Jesus turns right around and says, if you want to be a part of my camp, you got to hate Wait a minute. Jesus switches leadership style on the crowd. Uh Wait a minute. I thought y'all told me that Jesus and me loves the Jesus and you and that Jesus and you loves the Jesus and me. And it makes it so easy to love Uh the Jesus I thought I knew. Uh Y'all taught me Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. The Jesus I thought I knew. Didn't y'all teach me John 3, 16? For God so loved the world, That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, I am the whosoever, believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the Jesus I thought I knew. Then why is Jesus using language like hate? Jesus switches his leadership style. According to F.F. Bruce in his book entitled The Hard Saying of Jesus, 
One of the reasons that he says that it's a hard saying is because Jesus is the one who's saying it. It goes against the grain of nature and the law of love. That's a Jesus I thought I knew. But here, Jesus switches. He code switches, if you will, and uses the word hate. And so we got a sneak peek at Jesus's leadership style. But then my mind ran back to sitting in Dr. Green's class again. And he taught us about a man by the name of Eric Law who created what's called the cycles of blessings or they work in harmony with each other. I'm about to set it up for you. Not only are they called the cycle of blessings, but they're also called the six holy currencies. So the first currency is time and place. The second currency is gracious leadership. The third currency is money. The fourth currency is truth. The fifth currency is wellness. And the sixth currency is relationship. Now, they all work individually all right in and of their own selves. But when you put all six of them together and allow them to be able to flow in our lives, then those currencies work even greater. So we've already looked at um, the leadership in the text, but I want to concentrate a little bit more on the relationship in the text. So Jesus uses this um, intense language such as hate, but not only does he use the intense language of hate, he's telling us to hate our family. He's not just using obnoxious language such as hate, but he's telling us to hate the very people that we actually love. Relationships, relationships. Although hate has many connotations and perception, it also takes place in degrees as well. And the term hate is used six other times in the book of Luke. Stay with me. In her book entitled um, The Difficult Words of Jesus, Amy Levine gives us what I call the five characteristics of how f- hate functions. Number one, hate can be received. Mm-hmm. Number two, hate has many manifestations. Right. Number three, Hate can be provoked by violence, persecution, and yes, even death. Number four, hate can be taught and passed down through generations, but thank God, hate can also be stopped. And number five, hate can be perceived in our behavior. Now, I know y'all ain't going to remember all that about hate, so let me wrap it up and bring it in to you so we all have the same understanding. The very hate that others had towards Jesus, his disciples, and his followers in the other passages of scripture, Jesus is now requiring that same hate from his disciples and those who are going to follow him against their own family. Let me say that again. The other ways in which these uh, five ways of hate are presented is towards something else. But now Jesus is requiring of those who are going to be in his camp to hate those in which they love the most. Now, this kind of a hate is different because it isn't taught as a child based on what other family members may believe. Nor does this kind of hate come from anything done from causing trauma, tragedy, or harm in somebody's life. Now, we can be trained to hate one group and love another. But when it comes to those who we already love, we cannot just turn hate on. 
It's not an emotion that we can turn on and off automatically, but like love is something that's felt in our hearts and not determined by our intellect. So I said all of this and I've talked about this hate and what it doesn't mean, then what does it mean then? And Jesus is simply saying, I don't really want you to hate mother, father, spouse, kids, siblings, or yourself. I just want you to love me more as we get ready to go on the journey. And what I had to do is I had to use strong enough language to get your attention so that way you can understand how important it is to follow me. Isn't that like Jesus? Sometimes he has to be a little harsh or like God in our lives in order to get our attention in order to do the things in which we're called to do. How am I doing? Am I in the text, Reverend? Am I in the text? And so, and so, and so he says, he says, you cannot be my disciple unless you hate yourself. You got to come on over to my side of the family. So what I had to figure out is what is family? And one of the things that me and my family say is family is who I say it is. (laughs) If I say you family, then you family. But in looking and finding the commonality in family, there's some things you ought to share and I'll be in my seat. Number one is we have to share some goals. Now, number two is we have to have some values. So we have to share some goals, shared values. Then we have to have some shared attitudes. Y'all know how we can be. And then we have to share in some practices together. Shared goals, shared values, shared attitudes, shared practices. Family is who I say it is. Shared goals, shared values. Share attitude, share practice. It's right here on my paper, it's on my script. <laughs> I told you families is who I say it is. One of the things we have to get past is this limited, radical sense of family just because they are in our bloodline. Because everybody didn't grow up with everybody responding to you like they were in your bloodline. But there are some folk that's in my love line because I say it is that I treasure. But wait, 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 wait. But just because we say church doesn't mean family either. Automatically. Just because we say Christian doesn't mean family automatically but you got to sit back and watch and evaluate that thing and say wait a minute do we share some same goals do we share some same values do we share the same practices and do we share the same attitude I'm out of word for today but I've been talking about hate so I thought I'd switch it back to the Jesus that I thought I knew, I really did know them. Come here, OJs. People all over the world. Join in. Join in on Love Train. Love Train. I know that may be a little, little edgy for some of us, so how about this one? I lift my hands in total adoration unto you. You reign on the throne for you are God and God alone. Because of you, my cloudy days are gone. I can sing to you this song. I just want to say that I love you more than anything. Y'all know love, love me in your arms. You are the shelter from the storm. Let's go to the vamp. I love you, Jesus. 
I worship and adore you. I wish I had a voice. I just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. To Jesus, I thought I knew.